In a time of growing isolation and individualism, we are reminded of how important it is to stay connected to God and to each other. Jesus gave us a meaningful metaphor to help make the point. I am the vine and you are the branches, Jesus declared. Jesus calls us into a life of connection before production, a life rooted in genuine love, a life that yields fruit that lasts as we abide in him. As we continue to say we are connected to Christ. He said, I am the true vine, you are the branches. And he continually had this appeal that we should remain in him, abide in him, make ourselves at home with him, stay connected to him. And it's through that connection to Jesus that we are also connected to each other. And as Jim said, not just us in this room, but us as the body of Christ all over the world. And as we remain connected to him, And through that connection to each other, we, like any living thing, continue to grow and develop. And with that growth and development comes fruit. We bear fruit in our lives. That fruit is so important because a part of the purpose of that fruit is to draw people to the source of life to which we are connected, and that is Jesus. As we think about our connection to each other, the unity that we share, the connectedness, you might say, that then becomes a witness to a watching world. In fact, in John 17, Jesus prayed to his heavenly Father, make them one, just as we are one. And through that oneness, he said, so the world may believe. You see, our connectedness becomes a testimony to a divided world about the unity that we can have in Christ. As was mentioned, next Sunday is Commission Sunday. You see the flags on either side. It's such an important day for this church family because we value mission work. We value our mission to go and make disciples all over the world. It's important to us. We want that to be not just a part of us, but our identity. We want to be disciple makers. And so next Sunday, on Commission Sunday, one of the things that we do is we call attention to what God is doing around the world through missions, through the missionaries we support, the mission projects that we have, and the mission trips that we send out. And it's so great to see more and more mission trips kind of coming back online after COVID and after the pandemic. Exciting things are happening, and God is doing so much around the world, and he's using us. And so another part of Commission Sunday is not just to see what God is doing, but it is to join God, to be a part of what God is doing. To be a part of something so much bigger than ourselves, something that truly matters, the business of the kingdom of heaven. And so we each one will be challenged to give sacrificially, to support our missionaries, to make those mission projects possible, to send people on mission trips. It's such an important part of who we are and what we do. So as we think about next Sunday, as sort of a preview and, I guess, promo, watch this short video. Hours before Jesus was crucified, he prayed for us. I pray also for those who will believe me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. May we be one. May we be unified. May we truly be connected, so the world will believe. And the borders of God's kingdom expand. When our fears of the future paralyze us, When our strongest opinions blind us to love, may we be one so the world will believe. When we find ourselves divided by politics and preferences, when we can't see beyond our own broken stories, may we be one so the world will believe. May our passion be tempered by kindness. May our vision be marked by surrender. May our mission be fueled by love. And when our eyes get blurred and our focus turns inward, may we look outside ourselves to see Jesus, to see others, to see the world. May we be one so the world will believe and the borders of God's kingdom expand. Let's pause in this moment and pray about Commission Sunday. Join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for so much. God, you are a good God who pours your blessings, your forgiveness, your mercy out on us. We are so undeserving. We live sinful lives. 
We do things that don't honor you. Father, you and the precious blood of your son cover us, forgive us, and we're thankful. And because that is such good news, we want to not only receive it and embrace it, but to share it with others. So, Father, help us do that. Give us the words, the voice, the message. Give us the courage, the faith, the ability, the opportunity. And, Father, much of what we do in that area throughout the world is done through our missionaries and mission projects and mission trips. So, Father, we lift those things up and those people up to you, the men and women on the front lines, Father, those activities that are taking place all around this world, even right now, to give you glory, to share your gospel, to advance the borders of your kingdom. Father, our prayer is that we can be a part of that, that we can be connected to you, connected to each other, and that our unity, our oneness, would bear witness to you and to your goodness and to the unity you have with the Heavenly Father and through the Spirit that works in our lives. So, Father, we pray that you would continue to use us. We humbly ask your blessings and guidance. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you have your Bible in front of you, if you'd like to follow along, you might open it up to John chapter 15. John is not too long after the New Testament starts, if you're somewhat new to the Bible. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 15. And then you might also want to put a marker in Galatians 5. Galatians 5 is a little bit later in the New Testament. John 15 and Galatians chapter 5. If you're like me, I like to have it in front of me so I can kind of see things myself and the context and that kind of thing. So we'll be in those two places. You know the saying, you can't judge a book by its cover, right? Well, evidently, you can't necessarily judge a mouse by her costume. Look at this picture, someone catching Minnie Mouse on a break. I've shown this picture to a couple of groups recently, and they have the same response, sort of surprise and disappointment. (laughs) I'm glad many of our children are in Bible hour, right? Because this could be traumatic. This could be traumatic. What do you mean Minnie Mouse is a dude? (laughs) And he smokes? Really? Uh, Yeah. You know, things aren't always as they seem, are they? Things aren't always as they seem, as they appear. And you know that is true about your life. I know that's true about my life. Because what do we like to do? We like to wear masks. We like to put on costumes. We don't call them that, but we put an image out there. We portray a persona. And we want people to see us a certain way. We put veneers up. We keep people at arm's length. We try to control what they think of us because we're concerned about what they think of us. And sometimes what's on the inside isn't the same as what's on the outside. But here's what happens. Ultimately, that is revealed. Because ultimately, what is on the inside reveals itself on the outside. And maybe it takes time. And maybe it takes hardship. Maybe it takes being backed into a corner. But sooner or later, the real self emerges, and our true hearts are revealed. And the things that we value, the things that we hold as most important, become very evident by what we do, by what we say, by the decisions we make, by the way we treat people. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, By their fruit you will recognize them. You will know them, some versions say. By the fruit of their lives, you will see a glimpse. You will have a glimpse into the person's heart. You'll know what they are about by how they live, by the fruit that their lives pursue and produce. You see, what's happening on the inside will eventually make it to the outside. I think life is a process of bearing fruit, isn't it? Life is a process of bearing fruit, and we are either bearing the fruit that is about self-gratification... That is about the things that the world says are most important. So we pursue those things. The world sends us this message and it resonates somewhere inside of us that if you can do this or have this or accomplish this or be about this, then you will be happy. And that sounds reasonable. And so we pour ourselves into those things. And the fruit of our lives then gives evidence to our priorities and our values. And so we are either producing that type of fruit or we are truly connected to Christ. And we are letting the love of Christ flow through us like lifeblood 
through the vine, through the branches, as we are connected together. And then that love then produces fruit in our lives. The power, the life-giving power from our connection to Christ produces fruit in our lives, the fruit of the Spirit. So it's either fruit that perishes or fruit that persists. One of those enduring, lasting fruits is certainly love. And Jesus in John chapter 15 spends a lot of time talking about love. And he doesn't just teach us saying this is what love is. We know, and you know, if you know anything about Jesus, that he lives it out. That even his death confirms what true love is. He says greater love has no one than to lay down your life, to give up your life, to surrender your life to your friends. And then he says, you are my friends. He goes on to tell his disciples that he's chosen them. This is what he says in verse 16 of John 15. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Now maybe as we were reading that, you sort of perked up at that phrase, give you whatever you ask for. You're thinking, there it is. There's the formula I've been looking for my whole life. I've had so many prayers that seem to fall on deaf ears in heaven. And now I know how I can have my prayers answered. I don't think Jesus is offering a formula to have constantly answered prayers. I think what he's saying here is, Stay so connected to me, so much at the center of the will of God, that you will ask for the things that align with the will of God, and God will happily provide those for you, accomplishing his will in you and through you. I think he's saying, stay so connected to me, that all you say and all you do is said and done in the name of Jesus. I think he's saying, stay so connected to me, That you love other people as I love you. Stay so connected to me that you bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Fruit that means something. It's important for us probably to define what we talk about when we talk about fruit. In this context, fruit is referring to the evidence and the expression of the nature of Christ in us. I like that definition. This fruit that lasts It is the evidence and the expression of the nature of Christ in us. It's what's on the inside coming out on the outside. And what's on the inside is a deep connection to Jesus. And to the work of the Holy Spirit, transforming us more and more into the image of God's Son. And all of that is happening on the inside. It can't help to bear fruit and evidence, expression of what is happening on the inside. And Jesus points out a couple of things about this fruit. First of all, he says, it is rooted in love. In these nine verses, Jesus mentions love nine times. This whole teaching is really about love. Yes, he's talking about the vine and the branches and staying connected to him. But the connective theme throughout all of it is love. His love for us, our love for him, our love for us. For others. It's all about love. And we cannot claim to be connected to Christ and ignore or dismiss his appeal to love. I think it's safe to say that if someone doesn't love well, then we might question their con- connection to Christ. Are they fully connected to Jesus? Because if you're truly connected to Christ, the outward fruit of your life will be rooted in love. To say it a different way, the way you live reveals who you love most. Isn't that true? You know that's true in your human relationships. Isn't that true in the sense of how we relate to God? How you live reveals who you love most. And so Jesus says, you will bear this fruit that lasts. And so it's rooted in love, but too, as we just said, it is everlasting. It is permanent. It is enduring. It's not temporary. It's not short-lived. It's not the things that we often 
pursue in this life and that ultimately our lives are about producing. No, those things don't last. Those things aren't eternal. Those things are valued in this world that itself doesn't last. Jesus says, that's not what I've chosen you for. I've appointed you. I've chosen you to bear fruit that will last, that will endure, that is permanent, that is eternal. Maybe an example will be helpful. What kind of fruit are we talking about? What does it mean? What does a life look like that is fully connected to the vine, to the true vine, Jesus? What does that look like? Well, Scripture gives us an answer. Now go over to Galatians 5. In Galatians 5, the Apostle Paul explains what a life connected to Christ looks like. It is a life of freedom from the law, but fueled by the love of Christ. And just as Jesus emphasized in John 15, love, Paul here in Galatians 5 emphasizes love. He says, serve one another in love. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he contrasts this life as he says, is led by the Spirit, lived by the Spirit, versus the life that is lived for the flesh. Life that is truly connected to the source of life, Jesus, the true vine, versus life that is lived for one's own pleasure, one's own glory, one's own recognition. The things of the world, maybe connected to the world, maybe connected to my truth, maybe connected to my plans and dreams to be happy and successful and wealthy or whatever it may be. You see, those are two very different connections, and they produce two very different results. So notice what Paul says as he contrasts these two ways of life. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Obviously, Paul is dealing here with some Christians who are trying to promote legalism. Trying to find self-righteousness by keeping the law. And Paul comes in and he releases them from that burden. And he says to surrender your life to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Stop trying to control everything. Stop trying to portray this image to the people around you, even to God, that you are righteous, that you are good, and just surrender your life to the Spirit. He says, if you don't do that, here's what your life will look like. If you choose to stay connected to self or the world, if you choose to disconnect or sever your relationship to Christ to the freedom you have in Christ, to the love of Christ, to the power of his spirit, here's what your life will look like. And if you have your Bibles open, you can read right there. He says, it looks like this, sexual immorality and lust, impurity, idol worship, or we might contextualize that as materialism, hatred, causing divisions, hostility, jealousy, angry outbursts, Selfish ambition, envy, being drunk, and on and on. This life of indulgence and excess. And so he explains that these are not the things of the Spirit. These things don't belong in the kingdom of God. These are not the fruits of a life that is truly connected to Christ. But then he continues. What about a life that is connected to Jesus? What about a life that is abiding in Christ. He says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ, I like that phrase, those who belong to Christ, those who are with Christ, abide in Christ, make themselves at home with Christ, what about them? This Jesus who was crucified, who has crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, that's what they have done. If we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit as well. Did you notice, at least in our English translations, he uses a couple of different phrases there. He says, walk by the Spirit. He says, led by the Spirit. 
and he says, live by the Spirit. Obviously, there's a lot of overlap there, but I like the nuance. As you walk through life, as you walk through decisions, as you walk through your daily routines, is the Spirit leading you, guiding you? Are you led by the Spirit through tough times, through grief, through loss, through decisions? And is your life a life that is characterized by simply walking with the Spirit? Keeping in step, some versions say, with the Spirit. And what he says is, if you walk by the Spirit, if you're led by the Spirit, if you live by the Spirit, then you know what your life will produce? The fruit of the Spirit. What is that fruit? He says, it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Scholars have analyzed this list and they said, you know, there's some themes going on there. The first three seem seem to have something to do with our relationship or our connection to God. God bears those fruits in our lives. Love, joy, and peace. And the second batch really has to do with our connection, our relationship to other people. Yes, sometimes we have to be patient with objects, right? Computers and phones and other things, cars, but truly patience is about how we connect with other people. Kindness and goodness. And then the third trio there has to do with our connection to our inner self. What's on the inside? Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He says these are the things that last. These are the things that endure. These are the things that make a real difference in this world that mean something fruit that is valued in eternity. And before you simply dismiss this list as simply, oh, those are some nice little character traits that we teach our children with little fruity songs, you know. Fruit of the Spirit's not a banana, it's a what? Something like that, I don't know. There's some kind of children's song like that. Before you dismiss these as just simple little characteristics or traits that we should teach our children, let me just ask you to to step back and evaluate yourself in these areas. And don't evaluate yourself in comparison to someone else, especially someone else who you consider yourself morally superior to. But compare yourself with how Jesus modeled these things. How is Jesus loving? How is he patient? What kind of peace did he have and bring to others? All of those things. I think it's so easy just to say, well, that's a nice little list. It makes for good singing and good charts and memorization for the children. But the Bible says this is what your life will look like. These are the things that will be expressed in your life. This is the fruit, the expression, and the evidence of the nature of Christ in you. You see, a life connected to Jesus and rooted in his love will produce the fruit of the Spirit. If you don't think this type of fruit is what your life is producing, maybe it's time to make some changes. Maybe it's time to reevaluate. Maybe it's time to confess or repent, or maybe it's time to seek support or help, or maybe it's just time to turn things around. But see, so often what we do, sometimes when we're convicted, sometimes when the light bulb goes off, we say, okay, i got to make some changes, so here's what I'll do. I'll just try harder. I'll try to be more patient. I'll try to be more loving. I'll try to be better. And so we depend on ourselves. Or, probably in some of our darker moments, we simply make cosmetic changes. We put up a facade. We put on that mask. We want to appear to be patient or loving or kind or faithful or good. And so we make changes on the outside, but we never really address the inside. Do you remember what we said earlier? Eventually, whatever's on the inside will be revealed on the outside. I heard this illustration one day, and I thought it was pretty interesting. 
Let's say that I have a big apple tree in my backyard. And season after season after season, this apple tree produces not beautiful, juicy, good apples, but rather dry and wrinkly and mushy apples. Season after season. And one day my wife says, what is the deal with that tree? This doesn't make sense. Why do we have a big apple tree out there if we can never enjoy a harvest of apples? Is there anything you can do? And then a few days later, she's standing at the window, and she looks outside, and she sees me. And I'm going into the backyard, and I have a ladder and some tree trimmers, and I have a big staple gun, and I have two bushels of beautiful apples. You can see where this is going. And as she watches me, I set up that ladder, and I begin to cut down all of those old, mushy, dry, wrinkled rotten apples they fall to the ground and I push them away and then I climb back up that ladder and I take my staple gun and I start picking one apple after the other out of that bushel and I staple them to all of those branches every branch by the way at first service I didn't think to tell security that I'm going to be up there firing a staple gun so if you hear something don't be alarmed I gave him the heads up at second service So I go through the whole tree and I'm stapling all these beautiful apples everywhere on these branches. What's going to happen? Well, after a while, I'm going to step back and I'm going to look at that tree and think, that's a beautiful apple tree. Look at all those beautiful apples. And from a distance, it's going to look beautiful. And it's going to have all these wonderful, juicy, red apples on it. Problem solved, right? But what is my wife, who is watching me through the window, going to think? He's lost it. Yep, knew it was going to happen. It finally happened. He's cracked. Why? Because that's no solution. That's not going to do anything. If an apple tree produces fruit that isn't good, there's something wrong internally. There's something wrong with the system. There's something wrong with the roots. There's something wrong inside. And I can spend all day stapling beautiful apples on the outside, but it's not going to make a difference. And plus, what's going to happen to these apples? It's not going to be long until they start rotting, right? So they they start turning brown and wrinkled and get mushy. Why? Because they aren't connected to the source of life. They aren't really connected. They appear to be connected. There's a facade. There is a veneer. There is an image that says they're connected, but as you get more, as you get closer and you tend to investigate a little bit more, you see, no, that's, that's, there's no connection there. And without that connection, these will not thrive. And then next season, what's going to happen? Just because I stapled a bunch of good apples on a tree, can I expect next season that, voila, the tree will produce wonderful, beautiful apples? Of course not. It doesn't work that way. If what's on the inside remains unchanged, it will never produce good apples on the outside. How often do we approach change in our lives that way? How often do we evaluate the fruit of our lives that way? We know things aren't as they should be, and so we make superficial changes, cosmetic changes. We fruit staple. Everyone around us, from a distance, it looks like, man, that person has it together. That couple, man, they have a great marriage. Look at that family. They're perfect. And that makes us happy. But we know inside something else is happening. If the inside remains unchanged, the fruit on the outside will not bear witness to the nature of Christ. It will not last And Jesus said, I have chosen you, I've appointed you, I've given you this purpose to bear fruit that will last. Well, what is that? It's love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness 
and gentleness and self-control and many other things that reflect the true nature of Christ and the work of the Spirit inside us to conform us to the image of Christ. You see, bearing fruit, it's not about trying harder. It's not about greater resolve. It is about greater surrender. That's why Paul says, be led by the Spirit. When you allow yourself to be led by someone else, you are giving up control. You're giving up the reins. You're giving up the steering wheel. Do you know some people who, if you go somewhere in a car, they always have to drive? Some people are like that. And it's hard for them to, to give up that, I don't know, control, or maybe they're just, they've seen you drive before, so they're like, no, I'll, I'll take this one, right? Something to be said for that. When you get out of the driver's seat, you're saying, I give up control. Someone else drives, someone else leads, someone else take me there. And Paul says, live your life being led by the Spirit. Let Him drive. Let Him take control. Well, that means you have to surrender. You have to yield. You have to let go. Let go and let God work in your heart and in your life. And the fruit of that transformation from the inside out will be evident not only to you, to others, but to a watching world. So as we close, let me just ask you, what type of fruit are you producing? Be honest with yourself. What type of fruit, fruit are you producing? Are you stapling apples? And it looks good for a while, but you know there's little substance there. There's changes that need to happen on the inside. Are you bearing the fruit of a life that is lived for self and for pleasure, selfishness, the things of the world, happiness, accumulation of wealth, success? Or are you bearing the fruit of the Spirit, the things that really matter, the things that change lives, the things that change families, that change the world? Are you allowing the evidence and the expression of the nature of Christ to show in your life? If not, maybe it's time. Maybe it's time to make some changes. If we can help you do that, let us do that. If we can encourage you, pray for you, support you, let us do that. In just a moment, a couple of our shepherds and their wives will be in a parlor. It's a room right off the hallway behind me. You can go out the back. You don't have to come up here, but you can if you want. Go right out that door. You'll see that room there. They'd be happy to encourage you, to pray for you. They're going to pray anyway, and so they'd love to pray for you. Or you can come down to the front, and we will support you and pray for you. Maybe today you're ready to surrender all, surrender everything, give your life to Christ, be baptized into Christ. You know, we, we sometimes say when someone is baptized, you are dying to self. And think about the act of baptism. You are dying to self. You're letting go of that connection because you want to be connected to Christ and you're being buried in the water. And just as God raised Jesus back to life, God is raising you to live a new life, a new creation connected to him, bearing the fruit of his spirit. That can be yours today. If there's something we can do, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. Let's stand. I have